Hi, everyone. Okay, I um, let everyone in from the waiting room, so um, we will start. I am going to share my screen momentarily. All right. Um, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Misty Madero. I manage the UC Riverside EPIC SBDC SBR STTR Resource Center. I'm glad you could all join us today for our SBI talk series. We will be holding these webinars every other Wednesday. The next one is scheduled for Wednesday, June 3rd at 1230. We will be having uh, a few guest speakers who will be SBIR STTR awardees who will be discussing some of the ins and outs of winning an SBIR award. Our resource center is part of our UC Riverside EPIC Small Business Development Center, or SBDC. Our SBDC provides individualized support to early stage entrepreneurs and companies in Southern California to grow their businesses at no cost. Our services include specialized consulting, training programs and workshops, access to capital, and SBR STTR assistance. Our EPIC SBDC has a pool of seasoned professionals who serve as entrepreneurs and residents to provide business consulting to help you launch or grow your company. Additionally, our resource center provides the services you see on the screen. This webinar is brought to you in part and thanks to the SBA and our lead center, Orange County Inland Empire Network. So today we have scheduled our Q&A forum, but first we will also update you on some of the recent COVID related opportunities. So with that, I would like to introduce you to Martin Kleckner, his advisor, senior consultant, EIR entrepreneur in residence, and has over 30 years in experience and is our resident SBIR STTR expert. Terrific. Uh, mute is off. Greetings, everybody. It's great to see you in, in name, and I, rec I recognize uh, a lot of you here, including some who are at i -Corps. Hi, Carrie, from last evening and a few others. So uh, I guess you can never get enough of us. So I'm going to try to do the same magic that Misty just did and share a screen with you. And I felt that, and I, I understand that our aim today is actually uh, to operate uh, as a commons to uh, discuss anything that you want to talk about, uh, Q&A and so forth, but I felt that it might be possibly helpful to at least some of you who are in the life science diagnostic space to learn a little bit more about some recent COVID-19 initiatives uh, that are out there for funding. So let's see if I can share a screen with you uh, without too much of a hiccup here. Boom. There we go. Terrific. I can't believe I did it. All right. Terrific. Uh, so is everyone able to see this? Just a thumbs up. Misty, can you see this? Yes. Okay, terrific. Okay, so let me march through this. I promised Misty and I'm promising you that I will dedicate maybe 15 or 20 minutes, so I'm not going to do a deep dive in any of these things. But um, um, anyway, uh, Misty has already done this introduction. Uh, we, we concentrate, uh, we're part of the our, uh, research and economic development um, component of the Office of Technology Partnership. Uh, we are uh, uh, committed to working with you all the way from precursor, early stage, uh, non-dilution funding, which includes Partners for Innovation, uh, a PFI, SBIR, all the way through uh, equity-based capitalization throughout uh, your exit liquidity event. So we're with you all, all the way, multiple years. Um, this is where I'm coming from, from, from my experience, and I guess the only thing it really tells you is that I'm a gray hair, been around the block a couple of, a couple of times, uh, have uh, five startups, two liquidity events, I'm an i instructor, I've been doing that since 2015, uh, served as a um, 
uh, in a COO capacity for a 501 not-for-profit pertaining to childhood and adolescent cancers and have uh, a, a great deal of experience uh, with those Fortune 100s and Fortune 500 companies as well. So today, um, what, uh, what our aim really is, is for us to chat back and forth. And uh, so this is, this is essentially your program. So hopefully you are prepared with questions and even more hopefully that we'll be able to answer them for you. But I wanted to bring you up to speed on, on uh, an opportunity that uh, many of you are probably already aware of, but perhaps not. This was an announcement that was brought to our attention on the 28th of April. So it's about three weeks old. And this is a rolling submission opportunity for, so if any of you are uh, interested or participating or at any particular stage relative to a capacity for uh, a diagnostic for COVID-19 and any of uh, any viruses that they may that may come about later, the uh, NIB IB Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering has a five hundred million dollar fund that it has created, and it is a hyper acceleration opportunity, and the aim is for us to uh, compete for and deliver by the end of the summer a capacity 100 fold of where we stand right now for a diagnostic uh, for the uh, assessment of asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, individuals throughout the United States. So what they're aiming to accomplish is that any of us or you who may be at any particular stage, you can be early stage all the way through uh, beyond proof of concept and feasibility not necessarily FDA cleared for market, uh, but uh, at any of these stages, uh, they would be interested in hearing from you. And the, the good news is that this is a rapid turnaround. It's rolling and uh, they will make an evaluation within one week based upon your submission. If you are cleared for funding, uh, it's a three-stage process, which I'm going to be discuss discussing in the ensuing slide. But in addition to the funding, you will have an opportunity to work with and collaborate with assigned experts from each of these five entities, these federal entities, in order to heighten and optimize your chances for success. So it's a three-stage process. Uh, we're in a national call right now. We are now in what we are calling phase zero. It's sort of like a shark tank like uh, format where you submit, and I'll share with you the online portal, by the way, uh, relative to how you can uh, submit your proposal. Of those, a few will be selected for uh, further due diligence and uh, what they call validation and risk review. And for those who pass that sniff test, then you will be forming a collaborative arrangement with, federal, with those five federal entities that I had referenced in the prior slide. So as I say, it's a rolling review. That is your link there. And as I had also noted, they will review within one week of receipt of your proposal. And there is a, that three-step process that I had referenced earlier. And the aim is to get into the deep dive portion of that, which is the third stage. So they're milestone based also, and that is to say that of the award that you get, and the reward is not, there is no ceiling, there are no specific numbers amount, but I, as I indicated, the fund is total at $500 million. And depending upon what your proposal and your suggested offering is going to be, uh, then that will uh, in turn uh, amount to a negotiated uh, number that would be used to accelerate your, um, uh, your proposed initiative. Um, you also would be required to comply with uh, something called GAITS Gates. And that's uh, the Gates stands for Guidance and Impact Tracking System. So was, there is a platform platform based process that you would work with in collaboration with those uh, federal agency experts and so forth. By 
full over rate, overhead rates applicable, that is basically the same as what would be the case for an NIH SPIR, which is traditionally 40%. I wanted to remind you also of BARDA. Uh, Misty and I had discussed this about three, maybe four weeks ago, Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Again, for those of you who have been working on or considering medical countermeasures is what it's called, vaccines, drugs, diagnostics, and so forth. Um, if there is an interest in BARDA, uh, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of funding available for them, and there has been uh, a fairly extensive amount of interest there. If you are interested in looking into that a little bit further, uh, I'll be very, very happy to discuss this with you and work with you on that to hopefully ensure and optimize your proposal to them. I'd also very highly recommend, as I always do, I'm a pollination a person, which means that build a relationship, let them get to know you, you get to know them, work out opportunities where they become keenly interested in your initiative even before you submit a proposal. So if this is of interest to you, we can help you develop a slide deck and a manuscript, and a manuscript in this case can be a two or three page executive synopsis as well. Um, uh, discussion delineation of your uh, publications and any other that any other uh, bit of information that you feel might be appropriate that would be non-confidential. Highly encourage you to consider tapping into TechWatch because what TechWatch does is it offers you an opportunity for the visibility. That's what I meant by pollination. Get feedback and collaborate with experts. And, I, and I'm here to tell you that um, using this process, using this model in the past for NIH SBIRs and NIH SBIR phase twos, if they are keenly interested, have a great deal of interest in what you might be proposing to deliver to them, we've been able to arrange uh, reviewer meetings precursor to formal submission of your proposal and it is a tremendous opportunity for them to get to know you. It's a great chance for you get, to get to know them as well, and you will also learn valuable feedback with regard to what might be uh, ways to enhance the competitiveness of your proposal. So I would highly recommend that you consider TechWatch within BARDA as well. So we had also presented uh, these uh, FOAs as well. Now these, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part, may be appropriate or applicable for those who already have active awards. But I would suggest that you reconsider or consider any of them because there may be some revisions and they are indeed revising the eligibility or, or qualifications for the 10 that I'm referencing here. What I meant here is that uh, previously, about a month ago, you had to have an active award. That may not necessarily be the case right now. So if any of you are in this space, I'd suggest that you consider uh, these links, tap into it, take a look at it, and see what you think. And so here are examples. Now, I left from our prior presentation, I deleted those who already had an expiration date, but these have long-term expiration dates, and there you can see in the yellow boxes over to the right on, on part one here, that if you have an interest in any of these, uh, take a look at it, see what you think, I'll be very, very happy to have an in-depth conversation with you. And as always, we are here to help you with content, uh, specified aims, development of your commercialization pan plan. And if you feel uh, amenable to it, and as I've always told people 65% of the time, um, I, I help form the complete team to make, it, make certain that you have all the credentials and qualifications that would be deemed necessary for not only SBIR, STTR funding, but uh, later on private equ equity capitalization as well. Likewise is the case for this particular one. This one is of recent vintage and it was just um, announced two weeks ago. 
no surprise to you, cabin fever is for real. And there are bio, so, uh, bio psychosocial, that's a mouthful for me to say, factors that are now coming into play. So if any of you are in this field, social sciences, psychology, psychiatry, that feel that you may have a, a solution or an opportunity for funding, this may be of interest to you. Likewise is the case for women's health and dental and cranial facial research. Take a look at that submission due dates. Well, one is just around the corner. So I would of course encourage everybody to consider November the 2nd and not June the 1st. So again, those of you who are in the dental and cranial facial space and likewise are a woman leader, uh, this may be something of interest to you. I always, always, always encourage, and I'm very happy to do this in, in concert with you, get on the phone along with you to have conversation with program directors and other staff members to discuss your initiative to see if you are a fit and if so, how you might make it uh, positioned in a way which would be of highest op uh, optimal interest to them. We had some uh, revisions in terms of late application policy. Uh, originally, uh, late applications for those that had a deadline in March were allowed to submit no later than May the 1st. Now we've made changes uh, where uh, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, anyone uh, in who has been or who can demonstrate having been delayed as a result of the implications of COVID-19, submit a cover letter along with your proposal. Uh, you do not need to request any more advanced permission to submit a late proposal. Just submit a cover letter which includes a justification on why you're submitting your proposal late and it will be considered. Again, very, very happy to work with you on that. I've done a few of them. And, uh, and, and know what are the most compelling arguments. There are FAQs, no surprise, and they continue to build on a daily basis. So I would encourage you to also take a look at this link and uh, there may be some questions and bits of information that might be amenable and applicable to you as well. Um, yeah. Uh, so flexibility is available to applicants and so forth. I'm very, very happy to help you with that, but there's also a link that will pro provide you with some uh, additional information as well. Uh, but I've been through this on numerous occasions and uh, would be very, very happy to work with you there as well. There are a myriad of other external research funding opportunities. And by the way, um, we have a a list that we continue to build. I think, Misty, we have on file a list that is now north of 75 FOAs or RFPs that are pertaining to some extent, all of them, however, to a certain extent pertaining to COVID-19. Very, very happy to share that with you, or I believe, Misty, it's online that we can share with everybody here. I'm referencing AHRQ and the AHRQ, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. They pertain to uh, improving clinical outcomes, productivity, operations, and so forth for hospital, medical centers, and so forth, healthcare systems. If any of you are inter interested in this space, especially pertaining to digital health innovations, they may be of interest in what you have to offer. Also wanted to let you know that the Department of Defense uh, has a great, great deal of interest in healthcare. In fact, my very first healthcare venture, cervical cancer diagnostic and therapeutics was funded by Army Research Labs and we did all clinical trials uh, at Tripler in Honolulu in San Antonio and uh, uh, and uh, Reed Army Medical Center in, in, in Maryland back then as well. So think about this. This pertains expressly, however, to entrepreneurs who are within the Air Force, and they have accelerators in three locations. One is in Boulder, the second one is in Austin, Texas, UT, and the third one is about two or three blocks away from the Pentagon. 
So if you have uh, interest in e any of these five focus areas and would like to work with entrepreneurs within the Air Force, they may have an interest in speaking with you. The um, uh, other transaction agreements opportunity, OTA, is if any of you are interested in working a collaborative relationship with industry, or if you are in industry and would like to work in collaboration with academia or not-for-profit uh, entities, this may be the place for you. You do have to join the MCDC, but it is, a, it is a relatively painful process. It won't hurt. I'm very, very happy to walk you through that process as well. This is the Newton Award. There are 10 being offered. And so if you, it's not a heck of a lot of money, I grant you that $50,000 per investigator. Or if you are collaborating with someone, someone it would be $50,000 for each of you. So if you have an initiative, a proposal, I believe the May 15 bogey there that you're looking at has been extended again. But I will tell you that they have been absolutely flooded with applications. But I do believe it has been extended. But I will I will check on that and confirm uh, if and when and to what extent it has been extended. There are a few others as well, Johns Hopkins and the MIT Elevate Prize Foundation. Mozilla, for those of you who are software programmers, they also have been absolutely flooded and have shut down at least once in order to cope with the, with the flood of applications. Pfizer may indeed also be extending its deadline. I think they have a deadline, which is just a stone's throw away from us right now, uh, like Friday. But I do believe, uh, after speaking with them a couple of weeks ago, that they are considering seriously to extending that submission deadline. And likewise, for those of you who have innovative ventilator ideas, uh, you might want to consider the XTEC COVID-19 ventilator challenge there as well. CDC. Uh, may not be a fit for all of us, but they may be a fit for a few of us. But regardless, as I indicated before, Misty and I have compiled the list and it is a living, breathing document. Uh, we continue to add to it on a weekly basis. There are actually over 75 COVID-19 FOAs and RFPs. Very, very happy to share it with you or Misty will be very, very happy to uh, provide you with that link, let you take a peek at it and see if there might be uh, an FOA or RFP that, have, that is of interest to you. So, Misty, I hope I complied with the 20 minute uh, deadline. If I did, that'll be a miracle I never have before. So those are the two um, suspects that you wanna talk to right there. Very, very happy to do that. And so uh, Misty, I'll pass the baton back over to you and uh, Hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, sufficiently and adequately answer any questions that you have. And as I always say, if for whatever reason we do not have a good answer for you, I promise you we'll have a turnaround of 24 hours to get back to you. So back over to you, Misty. So um, with that, I, I think we have a small group today. So if you guys want to just try and chime in, you can either write the question in the chat or if you want to, Put on your video and unmute yourself and just ask us. Um, that that would work. Um, so we're open for questions. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> Greetings. Greetings. Uh, this is uh, John Wong. I'm I run a biotech company and we are developing a diagnostic uh, for the. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, both an antibody and a uh, uh, genomic test, yep. uh, and it's going to be a test kit, which is going to be into a microfluidics uh, chamber, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm planning on spinning that out and uh, collaborating with uh, uh, a person that helped us develop the technology and taking it into an incubator. Uh, he's now, uh, he did his postdoc at Caltech. He's now consulting with Roche on the diagnostic side up in the Bay Area. Fantastic. Can, can we file for an SBIR and, and do we have to spin out from a current company to do that? Do we have to form another enterprise, uh, another corporation? 
because uh, we're going to start filing provisional IP on this? The answer is no, you do not need to form a new small business concern, as far as I can tell. Okay. Um, and there, um, anytime, John, that there is an academic industry collaboration, that is to your advantage. The reason being is that if there is an industry partner, and, and I've done, uh, John, are you on the industry side or are you academic? You mentioned Caltech. No, I'm on the industry side. Um, okay. I've, I've had a long pedigree. I mean, I had a long lineage going all the way back to being an analyst on Wall Street to uh, now um, running a stem cell company. Oh, uh, fantastic. In, yeah. in Los Angeles. But, uh, you know, we're spinning this out because of the COVID and uh, develop some technology along that line, both in uh, using uh, next generation antibody detection uh, for right. neutralizing antibody and next generation uh detecting RNA sequences uh, without doing PCR. Well, terrific. There, uh, there has not yet been a proposal that has not indicated that, we're, that uh, they're going beyond PCR. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that, yeah, that is apparently is demonstrating to be of keen interest to the folks back east, uh, which is terrific news. It also says, of course, is that the, you have competition but, okay. Well, I don't yeah. mind competition. The, the question is, uh, there's, yeah. so many, there, there's so many grants. Some came through the, the Southern California um, Biotechnology Conference uh, Council right. and, and uh, with Ahmed. And we just got, and you know, NIAID is now asking for grants uh, uh, proposal in that area. So we're thinking about which one we should apply for. We're, you know, we're limited on time because we're going to run some experiments. Uh, well, I'd be very happy to talk with you further, John, if you wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison and then maybe, um, um, perhaps I can help in terms of making, uh, helping you make a determination on which one of those might be uh, most uh, appealing to you, uh, but also at the same time, one that might provide you with the, with the best chances. But the NIAD, uh, and I doubt that the... Um, uh, RADx is going to have uh, a small number of applicants as well, and I suspect also that you have already uh, looked into NIH 20-177 as well. Well, I kind of looked into it, but then we got focused on designing the experiments, and so that's what we've been doing the last month, and, uh, ordering reagents and so forth to to run some of these experiments. Uh, sure. We're just about ready to run them, uh, sort of proof of concept experiments, and then uh, take it to uh, applying for grants uh, while we get sure. some of the initial data. Got it. But maybe I could talk to you offline on this. I don't want to hog up the time. So I'll send you uh, an email with my contact information. We could set up a time to talk. Thank you, John. Sure. Look forward to it. Happy to okay. do it. Okay, great. Hey, I'm Martin, I have a question. Yeah. Does, uh, the NSF accept drug development projects for the SBIR program? Uh, yeah, on occasion. Now, every, the answer is yes, they will. Uh, um, there is a, a sharp fellow by the name of Jose Soriano Moya. Uh, he's got more initials than I've ever seen behind his name. He's a PhD, MD, uh, and, you know, the whole shooting match. Uh, he Now, keep in mind that the National Science Foundation is more engineering focused than the NIH. However, they do place a very heavy emphasis on life science as well. But if you are focusing on drug development, I would suspect that the NIH might be your initial consideration. That being said, uh, if we suspect that uh, the NSF might be interested in having a play. Um, uh, as I've indicated a myriad of times, uh, an email and a phone call, it couldn't hurt. And uh, they know us and they're happy to take our calls and to have a deep dive conversation. So if the NSF is of interest to you, and I will tell you this, that the NSF is pursuing of course, COVID-19 solutions as well. It's worth a shot to have a conversation with them. But I would still argue that your first 
uh, consideration would most likely be the NIH. Okay. Does that answer the question, Misty, or trying I to- I believe so, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, does anyone want to jump in with a question? Well, aren't we the popular ones? Hey, um, my, my name is Argus and I'm a, I'm a postdoc uh, slash entrepreneur. And um, I uh, understand that you're saying that the NIH uh, applications are preferred but uh, in my experience, NIH applications do require a lot of preliminary uh, experiments. That so, is a fact. That's true. Yeah. Um, uh, since nobody's really done too many experiments on COVID, I mean, unless, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, but like, um, I, what, uh, what, how, how, do you, how do you like, uh, can you like convert like, um, like previous pre-existing data into um, like COVID related? Yes. Into, yes, you can. And, and they are assertively looking forward to that, forward, uh, forward to that, and fully expected, Argus. So, um, yeah, if you have, and in fact, uh, the, that laundry list of 10 um, uh, FOAs that I had showed you on one of those slides are all with the express purpose of repurposing. So, uh, if you have... Um, uh, a, a solution, an innovation, a drug, or whatever that was uh, indicated for some other disease or disorder, uh, and if you believe that it might uh, have uh, impactful implications for COVID-19, uh, they will be very, very happy to consider it. You know, we're, we are, uh, frankly, I mean, what we're dealing with here is an environment that uh, uh, the federal agencies are wide open to just about anything. And if they feel that uh, this is an opportunity that is worthy of considering, then let's go for it. I had mentioned that Army Research Lab as, as a com uh, by comparison uh, for my very first venture a million years ago for cervical and ovarian cancer. Uh, we had actually taken that technology out of the University of Hawaii where we were deploying it uh, to examine the precursor um, degradation health of coral. And uh, so we repurposed the same technology for, uh, for examination of the cervix. So who would have thunk it? So uh, if you have something that you feel is appropriate, uh, has, has high chance of, of impact, then by all means, uh, you are um, very much encouraged to submit your, your proposal for consideration. Hey, Martin. Hi, yeah. this is Sean Evans. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. Okay, I'll go quick. Um, mm -hmm. I was just curious about this repurposing of tech um, in situations that are not related to this COVID-19 solicitation, mm -hmm. just regular SBIR. If we had technology developed under a different SBIR, but see a new request that lines up pretty well. I mean, do you see that as an effective strategy still of using previously developed technology if you were to repurpose it for a new, I guess, patient cohort category that fits another application? I mean, can you submit an application that's maybe just, you know, around the software and the data crunching on a new patient cohort based yes. on previously developed? Yes, you can. And that one technology that I had mentioned where we were examining the health of coral off the shores of Hawaii, now being used for cervical cancer, that, that may be one example, albeit somewhat extreme. But uh, again, the, the that, that list of 10 that I had um, noted in one of the, uh, the slides uh, on my, my talk today, they are all um, active awards that were that uh, the innovation is being uh, the aims for something not pertaining to COVID-19 and not necessarily by the way pertaining to the disease itself but perhaps for some um, uh, some indication and it could be tracing tracking it could be IT focused 
Uh, it could be behavioral modification. It could be a variety of uh, reasons. But if uh, there is a way where it could be uh, deployed successfully for the uh, identification, diagnosis, control, ongoing management of COVID-19, and whatever comes after COVID-19, they're interested in taking a look at it. So that's my long-winded way of saying, yes, probably um, you can. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you know, again, everybody, this um, situation that we're dealing with, um, it, it may be presenting as though we're grasping at straws, but we're trying to grasp at straws in the most educated and, and intelligent way that we, we possibly can. But if you have an idea which you think has a very serious and impactful play, let's give it a shot. What are they going to do? Say no? So, um, yeah, go for it. Cool. Thanks. Hi, Martin. This is Shana Vaz. Um, I hey, Shana. Hi, how are you? Thank you, for, uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. My question is, what is the turnaround time for these SBIRs? Do you know, with the NIH, for example? Sure. Now, there are the, the traditional non-COVID-19 SBIR is six to nine months. Yes. As you already know. Mm -hmm. For the accelerated FOAs, the turnaround is generally 45 days for them to evaluate and ideally um, announce an award that you have been uh, cleared and that you are getting awards. So that's 45 days. Then 15 days ballpark to uh, be open to receiving the funds in order to produce your work. So we're talking about a grand total of 60 days in general. Now the Rad X that I had discussed earlier is super acceleration. And we're talking about a decision turnaround of a grand total of one week. And uh, that would be then a, a refinement of all the applicants then there would be a week or two, not much greater, to do a deeper dive audit and consideration of what you have and what your um, uh, credentials and capability to perform what you had proposed to perform. And very quickly thereafter, the funds and the collaborators would uh, be showing up in your doorstep, so to speak. So many of the FOAs and RFPs that we're talking about now are actually in a matter of weeks or no worse than two months. Are most of we're, these we're, yeah, go ahead. Are most of these FOAs looking for a complete solution? For example, my solution is actually centered around sample collection and stabilization of the virus long term at ambient you know we have been able to stabilize it for close to two months at room temperature both saliva as well as nasal swabs right um, but we don't have the follow-on partnership for um, pcr assays because we are agnostic to it you know it could be done on any platform mm -hmm. but do you think because i've heard you know the opinion that they're looking for a full solution they don't just want the up upfront, although I think the upfront is very important. They are not necessarily looking for a full solution. Okay. If you are a critical, a vital component of a full solution, they will consider okay. you. All right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, mean I, I may be sounding to all of you that everything is like, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. But we're in a situation where we're willing to look at anything right now. Mm -hmm. So if you have something that truly is uh, something that could be not only innovative, but making a rapid turnaround um, contribution, especially the rad X types, where they're trying to deploy a solution, or in your case, a portion of an overall solution by the end of the summer, probably September, I guess, or maybe October is the definition mm -hmm. of the end of summer. 
then they're willing to take a look at it. Okay. The other examples, by the way, that I had given you all, um, were uh, they are not just, they're looking at a couple of things here. They're looking at COVID-19, not necessarily now, but if any of you torture yourself by watching the news, uh, you're hearing that there's a wave that is anticipated. Yes. What we're all chasing after is, is to head that wave off at the pass. So that's what, we're, that's what they're really looking for by end of summer. That being noted, um, I think um, many folks have decided, you know, maybe this uh, pandemic stuff is, is, is actually for real. And if this one happened, uh, then another one is most likely. Maybe we should prepare and set the stage for whatever is in the pipeline next year or the year after that. So that's why I showed you also those that had deadlines in 2021 as well. So there are two basically um, time window goals. One is the end of the summer, one is 2021 and, and thereafter. Thanks, Martin. Uh, one more question. If, mm -hmm. you know, since we are already working on it, nobody can stop work on this, right? It's important enough where you just continue whether you have funds or not. Well, from sure. any of the granting agencies. But is it possible for us to get back paid for all the expenses on the, you know, on the project or you just, you know, have to have to bill going onward? Not prospect. For the mo for the most part, it's onward. Okay. And not get back paid. Sure. I wish. I know. But no, but 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 it's worth a question. On, yeah, yeah, you, sure. It's certainly worth the question. There's no question about that. Um, but um, yeah, uh, just just assume and plan that for the subsequent ensuing work, yes. that you would be funded for that. Yes, I did. Thank you. Yeah, and and uh, unfortunately, you may have to rely uh, on the same capital resource that I did for my startups. Um, Visa, MasterCard, yes. <laughs> robbing, robbing 7-Eleven or whatever, you know, whatever I had to do. Yes, yes, begging the vendors, can you give us some more time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can most certainly relate. Thanks, Martin. Yep. Martin, I have a question from the chat. Okay, hi, chat. <laughs> My startup is in the sports space utilizing new compounds and experimentation with Magnesium, can I possibly apply to the NIA grant? How would I approach or repurpose the approach? Now, did you say sports? Sports space, yes. Okay, so sports and as in Major League Baseball, uh, NFL, NBA, that kind of sports, college, high school, is that what I'm hearing? Um, Ballpark. And the, and, and the reason why I'm asking that is then, then you, I think I heard, was it NIA? Yes. National Institute of Aging? Yes. Okay. And so I suspect to connect the dots, we're talking about Alzheimer's. Um, uh, uh, wh what, why am I going blank? Is it yes. Tra yes. Traumatic, yeah, trauma and so forth. Yes. <laughs> Um, interestingly enough, the NIA has indicated to me on separate occasions that they are not getting the quality proposals that they are hoping to get. Um, and I'm not going to say that they are a little bit more liberal if you submit to them a high caliber proposal, but they are most receptive to sports related injuries such as concussions and traumatic impacts and so forth. And uh, so uh, I have worked with initiatives for even film tracking episodes on the playing field or the pitch for any of you who are from the UK, um, but also for football, for any sport that presents with the occurrence or the risk of collisions that could be uh, causing a concussion or will be tied worse. The NIH would be very receptive to hear your story. Yeah, um, interestingly enough, um, maybe it's because we're not 
as aware of NIA as opposed to the other sub agencies of the NIH, but um, we've had some pretty good su recent success stories of the NIA funding, and they are most definitely keenly interested in sports. Hi, Martin, this is Carrie. Uh, hey, can Carrie. you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, great. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I did learn a lot from you. Um, as you know, I am working on a platform that try to connect senior with, uh, with uh, their family members as the local community. I just wonder, am I eligible to apply for the NIH uh, program, NOTOD 2103 that you mentioned in the previous slides? You're eligible for the NIA? which is a sub-entity of the NIH. If, uh -huh. you, ha if you have a, a proposal pertaining to uh, something that might be appropriate to another sub-entity or sub-agency of the NIH, uh, the answer is correct. There are indeed, uh, there is indeed great interest in the NIA and other agencies uh -huh. to fund, um, for example, uh, caregiver enterprises or the means to care for patients within hospital, hospitals, hospices, mm -hmm. wonder why I'm having trouble saying that, but also increasingly for at-home care. Mm -hmm. So there uh, actually has been an expansion of funding in that arena. So do I need just provide them a proposal or do I need to have a MVP order in order to apply for this grant? You can, uh, it is always helpful to have with the NIH as um, uh, someone else had mentioned earlier, the NIH is interested in having precursor data from work being done. That is not a deal killer, however, if you do not present with it, if your overture your study approach, and the team that you have compiled has the sufficient credentials and qualifications and history of having done work in this space, you can overcome the lack of sufficient data. But that being said, this is where I become probably increasingly more heavily involved with you mm -hmm. um, uh, with regard to specific aims, uh, with the tasks associated with the aims, with the design of the approach, uh, measurable endpoints, statistical analytics, you know, everything that comes into play with the high, uh, highest caliber uh, research uh, design and management. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you come up with a high caliber a study approach, uh, the reviewers may overlook that you have minimal, if not non-existent data. That being said, it still remains that the um, rule of thumb with the NIH, mostly with R01, uh, which is basic research, which is not what we're looking for here. We're talking mostly about R43s and R44s, which are SBIRs. Uh, precursor data in the lab mm -hmm. uh, is always of great help, but that can be dealt with. Mm. Oh, thank you. Um, Martin, I have two more questions from the chat. Um, sure. First one is, we are a small stage biotech startup interested in BARDA funding. Mm -hmm. The BARDA EZ, it yeah. seems like they have cost sharing where they only want to fund 30 to 50% of the cost of a project. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? And if so, we were thinking of partnering with another company for the application. Can award, an award be split? Absolutely. Absolutely and encouraged. Um, not, but now, having said that, let me make certain that I'm crystal clear on what you're telling me here. Are you both startup partners? or is your partner uh, an established revenue generating industry partner? Or are you the small business concern and seeking a partner uh, within a not-for-profit university environment or a federal agency 
uh, or a, a not-for-profit research lab. Oh, hey, so we are the, the, the small stage biotech startup. We've got a little bit of funding through an accelerator program. Fantastic. And, uh, we're looking to try to leverage that as much as possible. So we've, uh, we've got a design on a protein therapeutic we want to get made. We're working with a larger partner who has some Series B funding, so they're at that kind of stage, um, to help them. Uh, and so they're, they're going to help us make the you know, molecule that we're trying to design. So I was wondering, it, it, so overall the project fits under one of the BARDA EZ focus areas uh, and I was just wondering yeah if it makes sense to if an award can be split does it make sense to try to split an award with them to kind of use maybe their clout and the fact that they've raised you know millions of dollars already uh, that's that of is that is a resounding and an absolute yes okay cool. um, <laughs> you know um, uh, for some of you who just didn't arrive from the planet Zorcon, we had something that occurred in 2008 and 2009. That was the Great Recession. And so since that time, um, uh, study section reviewers are behaving similarly to private equity and angels, uh, where basically um, pre-2008, if you would have asked us how smart we were, we would have said, we're one of the smartest people in the world. Just go ahead and ask us anytime. Now, post great recession, since we lost all of our money uh, for, the, with, for that, every morning we have to sneak up to the mirror to brush our teeth and wash our face because we're looking at the dumbest person we've ever seen in our lives. So the reviewers think pretty much the same way. And so if you have, been, if you have a partner who has vetted you, and they in turn have been vetted by their investors. That means that the reviewers can behave in an environment where they consider it is um, less risky because they, are, they behave, they make investment decisions uh, in a risk averse way as uh, angel investors do these days as well. And likewise is the case for VCOCs and private equity funds and hedge funds as well. So that is my long winded way of saying, if you have a collaborative partner who has, uh, as you have indicated, they've been vetted, they've been funded, they have the credentials and the qualifications, it just makes you look all that much better and a risk worthy of more consideration than if you didn't have that partner. Okay, yeah, and so that um, award could be split between By us. By all means, Okay. by all means, absolutely. Yeah. We'd much rather have half than none of it, so. <laughs> well, I heard that, and the odds of you getting half is a heck of a lot greater than giving a shot and getting none of it. Okay. Well, yeah. great. Maybe, maybe it's worth uh, kind of talking to you offline about the best way to kind of warm up to BARDA, as you are mentioning before, um, you know, how to get their interest before putting a proposal out. So. No, I'm uh, very happy to do that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You betcha. Martin, another question. Can a biotech startup submit an R21 grant application? Yes. Okay. And we work with R21s in addition to 43s and 44s. Okay. Well, Martin. not to mention R01s as well, obviously, since, right. we're, since we're a university. Martin, I just wanted to make a point. Uh, for those who are applying for the first time, isn't that true that if you have some, um, some data that you can show as historic data or data that you have collected that is not even connected to your project, you can actually apply for a phase two in direct to phase two instead of going through a phase one. Um, I, I would I would say that we would need to look into that because uh, the credentials and the experience mm -hmm. and the data that they are looking for should okay. be directly pertaining to the proposed initiative. Correct. And Absolutely. so remember that um, um, the bio sketches that are being asked for now, as you know, mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, have revised those to where we don't give them our 10 or 100 page CV, which yes. shows everything, including the time we were selling Girl Scout cookies and yes. lemonade. <laughs> but um, they, uh, they need the bio sketch and the data to pertain expressly to the proposed initiative. Correct. Yes, that's true. You yep. make a good point. Yes. Yes. But as long as that data uh, that you present uh, is related uh, to the project that you are, you know, initiating with them. Correct. You're at, you are absolutely right. Correct. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Sure. Any last questions? Well, they may have had enough of us, and I can hardly blame them. I think we've abused them enough today. But, um, yeah, we'll wait for some more. But otherwise, um, I personally would like to thank you for all joining us today, and I hope that at least some of this was helpful to you. And if you are so inclined, uh, feel free to reach out to Misty or yours truly, and uh, we'd love to get to know you uh, better and learn more about your ventures. I think we, did we have one more question? I, I have one question. Can you oh, hear me? Terrific, yeah. So uh, if I'm a, a professor at one of the universities um, and I have a startup, uh, which is a C-Corp, uh, but it's basically at this time, most of the work is being done in my academic lab. Yep. Uh, can I still apply for a S S S I B R yes. grant? Yes, you most certainly can. Most of our small business concerns that we, as as you as you already know and you've done it, you um, you had to small you had to form a small business concern, go through the registration, uh, which I know you loved entirely all the way through, and. Um, uh, so even working within the lab, now your application, as you already know, needs to be, needs to come through the SBC, the small business concern, but you can most certainly continue to be doing the work in your lab. So how will it, uh, so I will basically go into some sort of, uh, kind of agreement, sponsor research agreement with the university that I'll be using their facility. How does it work basically? Uh, Misty, you can answer that, but it's not as complex as it sounds. But Misty, do you want to address that, or I certainly can? Um, so th there are several ways, depending, um, you know, we have where you can enter into a sponsored research agreement to um, subcontract the resources, the, the research that you need. Uh, we also have, um, if you need to sort of rent certain spaces, certain lab facilities available. It, it depends on what services you need, but general, most um, small business concerns subcontract to the university and our faculty. And, and Martin, you can sort of um, go off we, that and-, and Sure, I, I will also say that we are, as we speak, actively working on uh, making life a lot easier for researchers and professors just like you uh, to allow for and reward the formation of a startup and to allow you the time to break away. Uh, and there are nuances, of course, no surprise there, but to, uh, but to allow you to break away and dedicate uh, time to the success of this business venture. And as you are undoubtedly aware, there are numerous universities uh, that um, actually not only uh, motivate and incent the uh, participation in innovative small business concerns, but it also in no way detracts from your pursuit of tenure track. Likewise, so I certainly don't uh, understand, I don't know uh, what your status is, but that always was a concern at many universities that, that um, I would actually be penalized if I broke away and dedicated a year or so to the startup and commercialization, because then I'd get tagged on my tenure track, which was 
a pretty close to deal killer to many of us. Uh, so uh, I, I can guarantee you that the University of California Riverside is exploring as we speak how to make life much easier for you to um, get in the entrepreneurial side of things. So on, on that, I have two other questions, follow-up question, if you don't mind. Number one, sure. uh, um, you had mentioned that people can reach out to you offline. Uh, if I'm not at UC Riverside, can I still reach out to you? Uh, um, or your um, services are only available to people at UC Riverside? We, we work with anybody. Uh, we, we, of course, dedicate our efforts, no surprise, to the University of California, Riverside. That being noted, however, uh, for many of the um, SBIRs and STTRs that I'm involved with, um, I have worked with uh, universities, we have worked with universities throughout the country. It really depends upon the initiative and where we find um, our researchers, academicians who have the highest, most optimal reputation and status in that particular space. So we've worked with Georgia Tech, Harvard, MIT, the University of Minnesota, um, and are starting to build relationships with the University of Alabama, and the list goes on. So uh, we uh, do, of course, uh, place an emphasis on the University of California, Riverside, but we also work very closely, uh, perhaps as no surprise, with our other University of California colleagues as well, UCLA, Irvine, UCSD, uh, and uh, a couple of occasions, Berkeley as well, and, uni and UCSF, some medical initiatives as well. So, uh, yeah, don't let that dissuade you. We're, we're, and, and Cal Baptist and Loma Linda, of course, uh, in our neck of the woods. So, so the other question I have is, um, is that if at this stage, because a startup, I do not have anybody else except myself, uh, you know, working for the company, is that um, is there any kind of limit of the minimum number of employees that the company needs to have um, before they can apply for SPR? Well, that's a good question because you mentioned the key word employed, um, uh, because you will see that as part of the conditions of eligibility and so forth for an SBIR, where that 50.1% for the PI has to be employed. The definition, the correct definition of employed means that from the uh, commencement of the project and receipt of funds through the completion of your final deliverable, you must be dedicated to the performance of the project. That's as distinguished from employment. Um, as a startup, we all understand why would you want to get health insurance and do everything that um, would be required if you had an employee. So they are in fact 1099s, not, not uh, you know, W-9 or what is employees. So most startups are almost by definition one human being. That being said, as a small business concern, and if you are submitting an SBIR or an STTR proposal, you and, a, you and I might want to, however, build a team and then they can be subcontractors, they can be subconsultants, they can be individuals who are performing key roles and responsibilities in the performance of uh, the study, at least portions of the study that is being proposed. That doesn't necessarily mean that they need to see with your business concern thereafter. On the other hand, uh, you all may have fallen in love with each other and said, you know what, let's stay the course here and keep moving, which is fine as well. But uh, these are e essentially 1099 equivalents. And employment means dedication uh, uh, as promised for specified hours to complete deliverables. You as the principal investigator, I'm assuming, 
for an SBIR, you need to be 50.1% committed uh, throughout the performance of the initiative. Thank you. you so for that, I think um, we are over on time. So I put our email, Martin and I's email in the chat. So please email us your questions, reach out to us. Um, and again, we'll be here in two weeks for our next um, SBIR Talks webinar. I will be emailing you out um, the link to the registration and also the slides from today. And again, please email us with any questions. We're happy to help. And we'll see you soon. We look forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Much appreciated. Love to get to know you.